Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. In the city of Montreal in the mid-1800s, it was on the campus of McGill University where Canadian football found its first home. Before the century was through, the game had moved from the campus and into towns and cities across the province. Athletes from every walk of life embraced this great new game, and ever-growing crowds made heroes of the men and boys who took to the field. In 1931, quarterback Warren Stevens made football history when he threw the first touchdown pass in a Grey Cup game as he led Montreal to a 22 to nothing victory over Regina. While that was Montreal's first Grey Cup, the city had already seen more than a few football teams come and go. Montreal went through a whole raft of names. Now, when they first won the Grey Cup in 1931, they were known as the Winged Wheelers. And then they, uh, over time, they had the, the Cubs and the Hornets and the Royals and different names were tried. And it was in 1946 when the, Lou Heyman and uh, Eric Craddock took over the Montreal Club and they picked the name Alouettes. The Alouettes were an immediate success. In 1949, they captured the East before facing the defending champion Calgary Stampeders in the Grey Cup game. On a frozen field in Toronto's Varsity Stadium, flinging Frankie Filchuk was a star on both sides of the ball. His strong arm led the offensive attack, and on defense, he recorded an amazing three interceptions as the Owls romped to a 28-15 victory. Everyone loves a winner, and Montreal loved the Alouettes. We were, uh, I guess, uh, almost the team of the city. We, we certainly pushed the... Uh, Canadians for the, 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 the team of choice. We were a team that had tremendous support from the city itself. I was really impressed with the city. I was impressed with the nightlife. I was impressed with the daylight. But uh, we were getting good crowds. And uh, if you were a football player in Montreal and you walked down the streets, they would, some of them would recognize you as a, being a football player. Through the 50s, the Alouettes rode another golden arm to glory the man who came to define the franchise, Sam the Rifle Echeverry. What a wonderful passer he was. And reportedly, Lou Heyman got him out of a football book magazine. He was looking through a football magazine one day and saw this picture of Echeverry and ended up signing. I didn't know anything about Canadian football. It just so happened that the University of Denver had a, a hockey team and uh, there was a uh, hockey players there from Canada and especially Montreal. And so I went uh, to them and asked them questions about the Canadian Football League. In Montreal, Echeverry learned the Canadian game from Douglas P. Head Walker, a coach who did things his own way. We never had a playbook. <laughs> P. Head Walker put the plays in on the, in the training camp and we ran them every day. Whenever he decided to put in a new play, he would line us up and he'd go through it. <laughs> So we just learned by memory. But no one had to coach the rifle on throwing the football. As a rookie, he became the finest passer in the game. He was the quarterback in Canada, bar none. He could throw the ball with 
with any of them, probably better than any of them. He could run and uh, he'd fight you tooth and nail uh, right to the end of the game. To kids, Echeverry was both hero and inspiration. We were playing this game and all of a sudden this guy came along and he said, hey kid, you want to learn how to throw a football? So uh, he shows me how to put my hand just right and all of a sudden I throw this ball and it actually worked. And he's walking away and these guys say, do you know who that was? And they said, that was Sam Echeverry. And I swear to God, that's the instant that I had to play this game. In 1954, to complement a magic arm, the Alouettes found a pair of magic hands, Prince Hal Patterson. I thought Hal Patterson was one of the greatest football players I've ever seen, you know, in pure talent. We'd go on the field and Patterson would go out there and we wouldn't see him till the end of the game because he was on all the teams, offense, defense, punt returns, kickoff returns, whatever you had, punting team, punt cover. He was an outstanding receiver and, uh, you know, he, he was... He was big, he was very, very fast, and had great hands. I, I, he may be as good a receiver as, as I've ever seen. Hal Patterson was the greatest I've ever played with. To this day, I don't find anybody comparable. In 1954, the Alouettes laid waste to the Eastern Conference. As the Owls took to the field for the Grey Cup game, Coach P. Head Walker and quarterback Sam Echeverry seemed an unbeatable combination. Edmonton, of course, had been the prohibitive underdog, and Montreal was supposed to just wallop them, and uh, when a team is that big an underdog, that always sort of attracts some attention. We went into that 1954 game read all the press clippings about the Montreal Alouette team and saw um, Red O'Quinn, saw um, Echeverry, saw Hal Patterson. I wondered anyway how we'd ever beat them. The powerful Montreal offense lived up to their reputation, but Edmonton and their great rookie Jackie Parker continued to battle back. Although playing with an injured shoulder, Parker's clutch plays kept the game in reach. Holding a five-point lead in the dying minutes of the game, Echeverry put the Owls in scoring position. Victory seemed a certainty as Echeverry called a handoff to running back Chuck Hunsinger. Called an off tackle play to the left with uh, Hunsinger carrying the ball from the right halfback spot. And anyway, he handed the ball off to Chuck and uh, uh, he was tackled at the ankles. The first thing I heard was the roar of the crowd, and the next thing I saw was Jackie running down all by himself through to the Montreal goal line. Parker's 90 yard run led Edmonton to an upset victory. But Montreal players insist that the game wasn't lost, but stolen. I will always say that uh, it was not a fumble. It was an illegal forward pass, and uh, I'll believe that for the rest of my life. I still to this day maintain that that was not a fumble, but a forward pass, and that uh, uh, it should have been called back, and uh, we should have won the game. But I can't rewrite the book. In 1955, Vancouver hosted a Montreal-Edmonton Grey Cup rematch, but Normie Kwong and the defending champion Eskimos were now an even stronger team. While the rifle set passing records, it was Edmonton who put the points on the board as they recorded a 34-19 victory. Sam Echeverry threw for over 500 yards in that game, and yet they lost the game by a decided margin because the Eskimos were huge defensively and you could rap, rack up big yardage between the 20 yard lines but you try to beat that defense from the 20 yard line in you had big problems we were a passing team and uh, we could score very quickly when we had the ball but against Edmonton they were a control type uh, offense and uh, they rolled the ball on the ground they throw little short passes and they maintained possession 1956 brought a third consecutive Montreal Edmonton Grey Cup matchup, but this time it was no contest. Although Echeverry continued to rack up the yardage, the Eskimos' defense never faltered. A 50 27 victory made it three in a row for the Eskimos, the West's first dynasty. Unable to recover from three consecutive Grey Cup losses, the Alouettes began to struggle. 
In 1960, management did the unthinkable. I was traded to Hamilton and uh, I refused to go. I said, I, I'm, a, I'm a free agent. Uh, I have a no-cut contract and you just violated my contract. And of course they didn't fight it. And uh, so I signed with the Cardinals then. In sharp contrast to the team that had once dominated the East, the Alouettes of the 60s struggled. In 1970, management made an attempt to recapture the team's past glory and enlisted Sam Echeverry as the Al's new head coach. The rifle proved to be the right choice as he led the third place Al's to the Eastern Championship and on to the Grey Cup. What a Cinderella year that was. Uh, the 1970 Grey Cup uh, was unbelievable. We had 24 little players out of a 32-man roster and a lot of rookies. And uh, somehow we always we came together. And uh, the one thing we did, well, we, we stuck together as a team and we played hard all the time. And good things happened. With quarterback Sonny Wade guiding the offense, the Owls hoped to conquer both the Stampeders and the horrible field conditions. It was a, a deal where the two third place teams actually uh, ended up playing each other, maybe for the first time, I don't know. But um, the turf was very poor and very loose, and uh, every time you uh, take, took a step on the field, you took some of the turf with you. I remember Sonny Wade picking up big chunks of turf and just laying them back out there and stomping on them and leveling it off. Uh, it was pretty soggy, but you know, when you're a player, you really don't, you don't see that. You just, uh, you just play the game. While Wade's game was without the flash of Sam the Rifle Echeverry's aerial assault, his short passing ball control game accomplished what the Airborne Owls of the 50s had never done. Montreal won the mud spattered final 23-10. And Sam Echeverry had as a coach what had eluded him three times as a player, a Grey Cup championship. As a coach, Sam Echeverry never saw eye to eye with management, and the rifle resigned after the 1972 season. His replacement, Marv Levy, a coach whose meticulous approach won instant respect. As soon as Marv Levy got here, he was like, he knew what it took to win games. He provided a stability, he provided a sort of an intellectual basis for it, he told people what he was going to do and what was important, how to get it done. I don't know if coaches didn't do that before, but uh, history has shown that he had the right answers. Marv took about eight of us in a room and said, if you guys play hard, you'll play here as long as you want. Well, no one had ever told me that that could possibly happen to me, so as a youngster you could imagine how euphoric I really was. But uh, Marv created trust, and we all trusted Marv, and we all played hard for Marv. He changed a lot, a lot of things about how we did things. Marv was very professional, very well organized, you know, and very methodical uh, in how he operated. Uh, he surrounded himself, you know, with good people, uh, had a good uh, scouting system in the States, and, you know, eventually brought some very, very good players. One of the greatest to don an Alouette's uniform was Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Rogers. Colorful and controversial, the self-proclaimed ordinary superstar lit up the field like none other. He came in with flair, pomp, extravagance, attitude. He was exactly what the CFL needed. And I have no complaints. Johnny Rogers played hard in practice and on the field. Johnny was such a dynamic runner. He was so uh, electrifying in the fact that he was so quick and whatever. He had exciting moves that, yeah, he opened up the punt return uh, and made everyone realize what a weapon, uh, you know, the kicking game is. Johnny was a great guy, great team player, tough, and for that four-year period he was with the Alouettes, he was a superstar and added a lot of excitement to the CFL. In 1974, Rogers sparked the Alouettes to another Grey Cup meeting with the Eskimos in rain-swept Vancouver, where history made them underdogs. We had a good veteran team that had, you know, kind of grown up together uh, under Marv Levy, and, uh, you know, when we went to the game, uh, we were... I guess lucky to be here and uh, you know but we in our own minds uh, felt uh, you know that um, we could get the job done. Got my first real taste of Vancouver weather because we were there for the whole week 
And I don't think the sun didn't shine one day, and I think it rained literally every day for seven days. We played in the old p &E Stadium, Empire Stadium out there, and uh, it was poured rain, poured rain. If you fell and slid on your back, you'd go 20 yards. It was really uh, terrible conditions. Despite the slippery turf, Don Sweet was the hero of the day as he kicked a record four field goals in a 20-7 triumph. And Marv Levy's Alouettes celebrated a Grey Cup victory. The following season, the Owls again faced the Eskimos in the Grey Cup game. In the numbing Calgary chill, kicker Don Sweet learned how fleeting fame can be. We were in a dogfight out in Calgary, probably the coldest game I've ever played in. 30 mile an hour winds, minus 10 or 15. It was unbelievable how cold it was. We had played a great defensive game and it was 9-7 with a minute to go in the game. A deep pass from quarterback Sonny Wade put Montreal into scoring position. With the ball in the Edmonton 11 yard line, the ever reliable Don Sweet was called in for the game winning field goal. But as the Alouettes looked on, a mishandled snap changed the outcome of the game. It was high enough, but it was about a foot wide. And I watched, and there was dead silence, eh? dead silence. And we, we just didn't say a thing on the bench, not a thing. Like, we can't believe that that just happened. And, and within about five seconds, you realize that that is the game. It's 9-8. <laughs> we lost. But better times were in store for the Alouettes. In 1976, the team moved into Olympic Stadium, and the crowds flocked to the new sports palace. We averaged over 50,000 people a game in that stadium. So the stadium was a real f drawing point. The team was obviously good at the time. And, uh, people started to follow, and the Francophone community started to get on board. They always said the Big O was kind of cold because it's got so much concrete and whatever, but. I tell you what, when it's packed with 60,000 people, it's, it's a pretty warm place. It was the Alouettes and Eskimos again in the 77 Grey Cup game, this time in Olympic Stadium. Despite snow, cold, and a transit strike, the place was packed. On a field more suited for hockey than football, it was a staple gun that stole the headlines. I said to the players, now make sure that you get the right shoes this week so that you're not slipping because that field will probably be frozen. And I never thought anything of it again. But when I went into the locker room that day of the game, I thought I was in a shoemaker's store. All week long we had been struggling with footwear because of the ice and everything. We tried a number of things and it wasn't until just, just before the game, in fact in, in the warm-up, that I noticed the uh, Bell telephone worker with a staple gun in his hand. And I just had clicked on me and said, hey, that's what I could use. It did give you traction, but I think what it gave us is a sense of confidence that uh, we had our footing, and it was a hell of an experience. Again, it was so cold, there was so much snow, the fans were going crazy, that it's one of those blurs that becomes part of a memory. The Alouettes dominated the slipping, stumbling Eskimos 41 to 6 in what would forever be known as the staple gun game. Whether the staples provided better traction or simply a psychological advantage, the Alouettes didn't care. They were hoisting another Grey Cup. In 1978, Joe Scanella took over head coaching duties with the Alouettes. Despite reaching the next two Grey Cup games, questionable management decisions and changes in ownership alienated players and fans alike. You know, all of a sudden, you know, things change. And, uh, you know, a great franchise started to go, uh, you know, in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, poor decisions were being made. And, uh, you know, a once proud franchise that, you know, was getting in this middle 60,000 people to a game uh, was now at the point of, of uh, you know, folding. In 1982, the Alouettes would indeed fold. Renamed the Concord, the team continued to struggle in 1986, a return to the Alouette's name did little to revive fan interest, and the lights went out in the Big O. Ten years later, the CFL's American experiment had ended. The powerful Baltimore Stallions were suddenly a team in search of a home. With nothing more than a change in name, the Alouette's were back in Montreal. You know, I've been around 
the Canadian Football League so long that I've watched Montreal uh, in the 70s when the Big O was rocking with 60,000 people. Uh, they had 67,000 at a Grey Cup with the Eskimos, so I've seen Montreal at its best. When Baltimore moved to Montreal and we went to the Big O again and 5,000 people showed up for the games, I didn't think Montreal was a viable market. And uh, all of a sudden, because of a rock concert that was taking place in the Big O, uh, Montreal was forced to shift its game downtown. We went to Molson Stadium. You should have seen Molson Stadium. It was terrible. It was dilapidated, part of the stands falling down. We said, well, if we cover it with a tarpaulin and we get to play, it's going to be fantastic. During the first quarter of that game, we were panicking because until seven minutes into the first quarter, hardly anybody was there, but there was a traffic problem. By the end of the first quarter, 17,000 people, people going crazy. It was just remarkable. Uh, the downtown core of people uh, embraced the team. They started filling the stadium. Uh, it holds 20,000, and we now have a, a record number of sellouts in a row. I think going back to the old stadium has really created an enthusiasm for football in the province. And when you look around at the crowds at Molson Stadium on a Friday night or a Wednesday night or a Sunday afternoon, it is just a wonderful mix of people. In 2002, the reborn Alouettes were again in the Grey Cup game. In Edmonton's Commonwealth Stadium, they faced their number one rival, the Eskimos. MVP quarterback Anthony Calvillo's powerful passing game led the Owls to an emotional 25-16 victory. And so the Montreal Alouettes are more than back in business. They have again raised the Grey Cup in victory and captured the hearts of sports fans throughout the province of Quebec. This city deserved it. The fans deserved it, the team deserved it, the players, coaches, everybody. But the city of Montreal, and really the province of Quebec, deserved it. And to come back to the city, and they threw an impromptu parade, you couldn't have got more people out. Over 250,000 people lined the streets to watch our parade. It was like something I have never witnessed in my life. The, and the message that the Quebec people were giving us was, thank you. Thank you for bringing the cup back to Montreal.